Firstly, the shape of the talk, just going to do the what is blockchain because some people may be coming just because they want to find out what blockchain is. Uh, <coughs> pros, cons and questions of sustainability. Uh, a couple of case studies looking at forests and diamonds and the use of blockchain. The emergence of the use of blockchain in uh, sustainable, trying to determine sustainability or sustainability of the supply chain. There's lots of elements to that. So beyond blockchain, that in much of the way in which blockchain is being spoken about, um, we forget that it's actually part of a much more complex and broader technological uh, transformation that's taking place. Um, and I think it's really important to understand where blockchain is fitting into this broader fourth revolution uh, that humanity has brought upon us, or some, some of humanity uh, living somewhere in um, America and Russia and somewhere else. Yeah. <clears throat> and then conclusions then. So blockchain, what is it and how does it work? Uh, I, I don't know exactly, uh, so I'm not going to pretend. Right? <laughs> so, key thing is that the, a lot of the hype around blockchain is that basically we are moving from this, where the internet, the excitement of the internet was that we could share things, we could share files, stuff. We now, with blockchain, will be able to share values in terms of assets, in terms of property, you know, um, carbon credits here, energy, uh, music, files, you can actually, you know, ownership of music, property rights, votes, you can actually share things. And it's that quality that is seen for that blockchain can absolutely transform society. Most of you will no doubt be going, when's she going to mention Bitcoin? Right, that's it. It's over. <laughs> That's Bitcoin over. Bitcoin is part of this. Blockchain is the technology that underpins uh, the, uh, the uh, exchange of digital currencies. Right? It was the, um, the hardware that was designed to ensure that there wasn't a double spend. It was called a double spend. Right? The importance of not having a double spend is to ensure the integrity of the system, right? Having a Bitcoin, a blockchain system, means that you can transfer funds immediately, you don't have to have intermediaries, and it's secure and immutable and all these things. So this is a long distance you know, from here, where money was hard to move, it had solid form, yeah. we're not there. We're over here. So the idea is we're going there. Right? But the bigger value of blockchain is that it is a ledger system that records things you can record exchange on via. And it's a system that's decentralized. So all the people who are involved in the network are, past, are visually, they, they see the exchange taking place. This is recorded historically. It can't be tampered with. So every exchange is authenticated amongst the collective by consensus. Right. This moves us away. I've got this image here, since I've got link by link. Jacob Marley in uh, um, <clears throat> Charles Dickens. His role was to record transactions and debt in the ledger. He was the one in control completely. Right? Whereas in the blockchain, everybody sees everything and nobody can be um, manipulated. So that's the idea in its magicness. So you get different types of networks. In a very simplified network, Mr. Marley is here. Um, but you could say the state, you could say a central bank, a centralized network. We're all, we all have to go to the center point to use and, and do our transactions and exchange. In a decentralized network, you can have a number of nodes, you know, sort of competitive environment. But in a distributed network, and this is what blockchain is called, a distributed ledger system, you are 
everybody is interconnected. Everybody sees everything. Now, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. Um, because this is roughly, in theory, how blockchain works. Right? So you get a request for something. So this is an asset-based transaction. A request, uh, it goes to everybody. Everybody knows about the request happening. The network of the nodes validates this transaction. This is what's known as, you may have heard uh, of miners. So the miners is the computer power to solve the problem, which is the algorithmic problem, right? The algorithmic problem is what's known as cryptography, and this is what makes it more secure than digital uh, transactions. Once it's verified, <coughs> you create a new block, and that block, which is verified and mutable, you cannot change it, is added to the existing block. And then the transaction is completed. This, in theory, can never be changed. Right? This is an open um, distributed network. Right? It's an open distributed network where it's per permissionless. Anybody can take part. Right? Now, that's the high end of blockchain being open, permissionless, democratic, everybody takes part. You deal with power, we, it's a sort of libertarian dream. You know. But it's not going to end up like that, that's the thing. And it's not ending up like that. <coughs> One of the big next steps is to, try and in the, is to try and break down the interactions on blockchain to pass value. And one way of doing that is through contracts. And this is where smart contracts come in, right? Smart contracts are, were developed particularly with the emergence of <coughs> Ethereum. Now, Ethereum is a new uh, medium that uh, a young Russian guy developed. <coughs> I've forgotten his name, Vitavek. Um, and it's like a virtual machine, autonomous program that everyone can use Ethereum and they can develop their contract on Ethereum and it can be permissioned contracts. And the way the smart contract works <coughs> is, so this, for example, <coughs> sale of a house. So you would have uh, so as the seller of the house, the buyer of the house, they come to an agreement, um, they register that, it goes to digital currency, the exchange occurs, and you go to a digitized land deed, right? At each point, uh, when there is an agreement, the next stage happens. So you break down every single, this is why it's important for sustainable commodity supply chains, at every point you can break the chain down with a contract. But it's what's contained in the contract that matters. Right? And that's about algorithms and code. And this is where trust becomes extremely interesting. If you <coughs> the emergence <coughs> of Ethereum and smart contracts <coughs> has basically led to this environment where we've got enormous amounts of uh, new initiatives. And this is a lot of these on, on the back of initial coin offerings. Uh, promoting an idea getting people to invest in uh, the concept of the idea and then developing these um, new platforms to invest in new um, uh, projects. So we've got all sorts of projects, and I'll get onto the, um, the uh, environmental projects in a moment. But basically, the argument by Nussbaum here is crypto economics users don't need to trust in anyone, any individual or organization but rather the theory that humans will behave rationally when correctively incentivized. Now, for me, that's, that's a very worrying statement. Uh, there's some key words in there, like humans, rationally, behave, incentivized, right? Uh, that's worrying. That doesn't fill me with trust because one of the key things is with 
contracts, smart contracts, is you will incentivize by code each phase of the exchange, right? <coughs> At the end of the day, the general consensus around blockchain <coughs> and all its hype is to say it's transparent, it improves transparency in transactions, it removes intermediaries, it decentralizes to this distributed ledger, it improves trust through removing trust, it's secure, immutable because of the cryptographic nature of the exchange, right? The disadvantages are quite similar to the advantages in many ways. Um, there's a lack of privacy. You have to expose yourself onto the network. And this is, uh, contradicts lots of people's inherent uh, feeling of security. Uh, so often people tend to go for permission-based systems. And when you use a permission-based system, you then hand, hand over control to whoever is managing, like in the case of Bitcoin, you would have a permission-based holder of the wallet, your wallet. So you don't hold a public wallet, you have a private wallet, which is permissioned, right? So you've kind of got, oh, you've, you've ended security a little bit, you've undermined your security. Um, you've introduced intermediaries, and intermediaries will take advantage of this situation by charging you, and then we'll start to see big intermediaries emerging. There's also the idea that it's not open to attack. Um, if 51% of all the uh, mining power for the algorithm to solve the problem uh, is held by one or a group of actors, then they can verify a, uh, an action on the blockchain. Right? Now, this, is very, this has been worrying particularly around Bitcoin, uh, and this is why we've seen some terrible things happening. Uh, it's because the majority of the mining power, until very recently, has been in Russia and China, uh, in big digital mining farms. Which are, and China's just reacted to this day uh, because it's been <coughs> sucking loads of electricity um, from, the, uh, from the national grid. Also, as you will know, there's a lot of hype about blockchain, an extreme amount of hype. I kind of was into it. <laughs> but it, it is an unproven technology, and with any unproven technology, there's high risk. Um, so... There's a question about, do you continue with something that's so high risk? Or how do you manage it? There's definitely an energy dimension to it. I'm sure somebody would ask me that question. It is to do one half hour of a Bitcoin transaction is the equivalent to the average American person's use of electricity for one day. So, you know, um, so when you, if you do the math when you're upscaling, that's a lot. And if you think about the inequity of access to electricity uh, in parts of the world, you know, this is adding to uh, inequity globally. And there's a big regu regulatory void. And part of the regulatory void is compounded, really, by a real lack of understanding, uh, obviously, because it's an unproven technology. But really, trying to understand how it fits in with incumbent technologies now, uh, incumbent institutional systems, there's quite a lot of work going on with financial systems. Um, but then looking beyond that, and that's where we're going to sort of look beyond. Because <clears throat> big enthusiasts see lots of opportunity for the use of blockchain to help resolve environmental problems. Right? So you may have already read recently uh, that you could use blockchain to increase uh, uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of recycling. Uh, in Supply chains, as I'll um, put, be talking about proof of origin, reduced footprint, unsustainable practices, transparency. There's over a thousand already uh, blockchain based energy um, companies that have been developed through um, IOCs, as I said, initial coin offerings. Um, there's an interest in using blockchain for monitoring and reporting in multilateral environmental agreements, 
I heard one on particularly around like the Paris Agreement, um, but also other ones like CITES um, on uh, the Convention in International Trade in Endangered Species. Uh, that non-profits could benefit from blockchain and be more effective in their work. Carbon taxes, carbon trading, uh, and incentivizing people. So sort of nudge theory, whatever. I like to nudge people into good practice. Um, so there's a lot of enthusiasm about blockchain, that it could do all these things, right? Now, you, you've got to remember, it's really only been around as a transaction for cryptocurrencies since around 2008. The technology has been around since the early 90s, but Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies since 2008 have really been the platform for experimentation. But now we're seeing some really uh, interesting developments eh? within this regulatory void. Yeah. So, I pose a, can blockchain help to guarantee sustainable forestry. Uh, <clears throat> forestry is a big, complicated issue, and sustainability of forestry is a big, complicated issue. Uh, lots of people think forests are great, they create jobs, wealth, it's a big sector, uh, demand is going up, so we need to manage forests more sustainably. Um, if we could um, do more sustainable practice of uh, informal wood production in certain parts of the world. We could increase the GDP in those countries, lifting people out of poverty. All these are very beneficial pictures of uh, forests and wealth. But then there's the nasty side. Uh, vast amounts of forests are illegally harvested, leading to um, degradation of ecosystems, uh, loss of habitat. The a the impact on indigenous peoples and their <coughs> rights, their claim for uh, territories that um, they've been trying to look after and preserve and then establish legal rights over um, since after colonial times. Climate change impacts on forests are making forest management, forest planning even harder now. Human rights issues, as I say. So these are many governance challenges, enormous amounts of timber flowing across the world illegally in these supply chains. So can we do anything about that? <clears throat> we could address the demand side that's driving deforestation. We could look at these examples here. Deforestation primarily in Brazil is uh, through cattle and um, uh, soy. In Malaysia, it's in palm oil. Indonesia, palm oil and um, uh, pulp and paper and furniture. But the key, the key thing is to address the demand side. But certification doesn't really address the demand side. It addresses the supply side, right? So if we're seeing increased demand, which we are, um, then Will we be able to achieve sustainability? Will blockchain be able to achieve sustainability? Can we trust it? If you don't address the demand side, have you completely undermined the, the trust in a, in a system? Because you're not really comprehensively addressing the question. What's been interesting, um, so as Levine pointed out, I've you know, kind of been involved in forestry. I kind of came in around here. Uh, uh, just as FSC, the Forest Stewardship Council and uh, PFC were really starting to get going. But before that, certification was being introduced for organic farming. Um, in the 80s, we've got earlier Fair Trade and the Rainforest Alliance certification systems. Part of the reason these could be done is we get the development and evolution of technologies. And I have to say, even though you know, down here, following all this. I really didn't follow any of that. And I didn't follow the, the interrelationship and the potential of technology in relationship to certification. I never really thought about it. So, <coughs> I think it's important to think about 
The elements of certification. So if you break it down into four elements, there's obviously more to it, but you need to establish standard and criteria. That is absolutely fundamental. What your standard and criteria to justify what constitutes sustainable, and then you are going to sell that as sustainable to the marketplace, it's going to be accepted as sustainable, is absolutely fundamental then you will certificate according to that criteria. You need people that are qualified to undertake that, people that can establish that it's met the criteria. You need to trust in those people. You then can have a label, and then the consumers need to trust in the label. They have to trust this system. Most people don't understand the system. Most people have no idea how this system works. But blockchain will include the system. And we will trust the label in our blockchain system. And the impact evaluation will hopefully feed back and verify that the whole certification system is working. But there have been, over the years, many reports about the failures of certification systems. <laughs> Um, and, I mean, they come out regularly. Uh, there was a very famous one back in the 90s, um, Trading in Credibility, which I thought was one of the best titles, um, Rainforest Foundation, uh, because that's what it is. I think, and I think that's a really nice way of putting it, trading in credibility. And it doesn't matter whether you trade in credibility like paper-based or blockchain-based. It's just you're trading on the trust of the consumers that it's, that it's uh, sustainable, right? There's nothing that blockchain is going to do to change that <clears throat> in itself, and that's the key thing. So should we trust certification? When I was talking about the amount of uh, deforestation, at the end of the day, and this is 2013, it's, like, it's pretty much the same, somebody can correct me if they want, uh, only 10% of the world's forests are certified, uh, and 28% of industrial roundwood is certified. The majority of this is in the global north. Uh, the costs of certification are a problem. Um, the scale is often, it's large companies that have certification systems. And at the end of the day, there's a dominance by two sectors, the uh, two sustainability criteria, so PFC and FSC. So you've hardly got sort of competition. It, it has to be a sort of almost a one-size-fits-all, even though they've got slight variation. Right? Um, <clears throat> so there's been an, uh, an initiative uh, out on a limb, sort of start, started up quite recently, um, in Brazil which was to, it's a responsible timber exchange. It doesn't use the word sustainable uh, because it's trying to meet criteria for legality and or sustainability. And um, it uses blockchain technology to track at each point along the supply chain uh, that all the requirements are met. Right? And this includes all the legal requirements, uh, paying tax, uh, when it's being exported, pay, you know, doing all the proper paperwork, etc. Um, this has only just started to be rolled out, <clears throat> and it's starting to get a lot of attention. I mean, I haven't done any research on it, but, I, but it's interesting it's starting to be rolled out. There's increasing dissatisfaction with certification. Is this an, an option to increase our trust and relationship with products that we consume. <coughs> now, just briefly, I want to go into the diamond supply chain. <coughs> um, with the, at the end, the diamond supply chain is dominated by De Beers, the government of Botswana, who sell on the De Beers, uh, um, uh, <coughs> what's it called? De Beers Trading Supply uh, Center, or where, see if I'm... And Arosa, which is a uh, Russian, rather, um, 
diamond trader. So even though if you got blockchain for the Beers who have been accused of uh, genocide uh, <coughs> and they completely undermined a process which I'll go on to uh, to establish uh, provenance and ownership of diamonds and our Rossa um, who although they've taken part in the diamond supply chain they are um, they are also equally obstructive to developments to try and include things like human rights in the criteria with, with the Kimberley process. So the Kimberley process, which was established in 2000, I had it written down, 2011, was it 11? Yeah. Relatively recently. <clears throat> the idea is that the import-export certification scheme, right? So it's not about the impact on the environment. It's not about human rights. It's about where it's come from that you can verify. It's primarily to do with conflict diamonds and blood diamonds. So it's motivated by what was happening in Liberia with Charles Taylor. Um, so that was the focus, you know, requiring governments to participate. You've got a very uh, um, small market dominated by key players, high value goods, very small goods. And, and so you only had to get a small number of players together and get agreement, but the quality of that agreement and the effectiveness and implementation is open to question. The last um, chair of the uh, <coughs> Kimberley process was uh, Ahmed bin Sulalim of uh, UAE. And he was the one that brought blockchain into the uh, Kimberley process. Um, <clears throat> he, what, he believed that, you know, basically to achieve a transparent, accountable industry, you needed to have much more on the ground contact and that this work needs to continue. So they introduced, they went together with Everledger, who are tracing ownership and provenance, but they're not looking at sustainability. And this is, this is quite interesting because people assume that what it means with Everledger and the uh, blockchain certifying provenance, that they're actually addressing things like human rights and environmental dimensions, right? And <clears throat> Everledger is, a, is part is on Ethereum. Uh, it's only because of that technology that it's able to, to be. But the primary goal of it is to ensure that the diamonds that are traded are legal and have not come from conflict areas. That's the primary aim. It's not about sustainability. Now, finally, I wanted to sort of, you know, the focus is on blockchain and blockchain as somehow the answer to all things. You know, that it's, should we be focusing on blockchain and trust? Or is there a bigger landscape in terms of new technologies and some of the older technologies? And there, I would say there is. But basically, there's sources of data that are, some are already well established, some are emerging, like machine to machine learning, that are being fed into what I would call the data space, right? in ways that it's very difficult to understand how it's being drawn in, into uh, cloud networks. And it's about who can control and interpret that space. Who can control and interpret that information? When the data is gathered, who are the people that are doing the analytics? And then who are, how is it being shared and used? Mary Hamilton, data isn't magic, it's what you do with it that counts. So the key thing, and goes back to the point that I was making a lot earlier, was that um, data is key to the way that blockchain contracts, smart contracts, are developed. If you're talking about a supply chain, you have to have, in each point in the supply chain with a smart contract, requirements embedded within that 
smart contract. The more requirements you have, the more complex it is, the more uh, energy is used to resolve it, the more costly it is to develop it. So you would like to set up um, a supply chain, sustainable supply chain, with as few smart contracts in it, but try and convince the end user that it's sustainable. So we're back to the same issue. It's like, what's contained in the code, which is your algorithms to be put into the smart contract, to determine whether you've met the requirements in law, in text, that when that's put into the smart contract, that it gets met, but you have no idea what's in that smart contract, how it's been interpreted, how the data has been integrated, and the analytical frame has been composed and constructed. So as a consumer, we are back, we are even further away from being able to understand sustainable and sustainability. At least I could go and look at FSC sustainability criteria and try and work out whether it was you know, reasonably coherent. And then maybe I could do some field work, you know, this is going to make researching and understanding what the components are, what the criteria are, and how they're being applied, and how data is being used to determine whether uh, the criteria have been met, and I, I mean also the legal criteria, harder to actually work out. Now, some people were saying, well, this would make it much more flexible, you would have a lot more data, you could, uh, um, it would facilitate much more localized, open, accessible, more affordable uh, exchange systems. I would, I'd love to, th I'd love to believe that. But I, what I'm already seeing is that the processes, the control over data analytics, and control over cloud systems, the major mining capacity, etc. It's very, you know, once again, it's very dominated by incumbent companies, but also emerging companies. And you need to look at this through sort of, with a sort of political economy eye and think, you know, the idealistic idea of we're also developing smart contracts and exchanging sustainable um, commodities, be that wood, be that any kinds of food, whatever. There's an idealism in some of that that I think we um, would be wise to question. And then, can we trust each other? This is my... <laughs> when one man is going up and putting his racing car by the sun uh, and other people are uh, in experiencing the impact of uh, ongoing extreme consumption which is completely unsustainable, not addressing the demand side, we live in a really crazy world. <laughs> and, uh, blockchain is not a silver bullet the broader technological framework within which it's uh, <coughs> trying to be uh, demonstrated that it could potentially deliver sustainable uh, supply chains is, I think, open to being highly questioned. But one of the big things is, is as a researcher, is understanding even how you begin to do that, particularly around un how algorithmic coding is incorporated into smart contracts and, uh, and then how that links with meeting the requirements with uh, data analytics and data availability. So that's, I did it in 45 minutes, said I would. Um, uh, <coughs> so I would hope you have some questions, because I've got loads of questions that I didn't manage to answer, uh, that I'll go away with. Um, okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, questions, I guess. <laughs> yes, James. When it comes to climate change, we pollute the atmosphere and rely on forests and other things to sequester the carbon. Mm. Governments are very reluctant to set up registers of who has the right to pollute or who's got um, the right to particular area of forest to sequester the carbon. 
this could be something that happens open source spontaneously to overcome the malaise of global governance, gov government, lack of it. But any views on that? Yeah, well, I, I, I think, yes, it could, but I doubt it will. That's, I mean, if that's all I can say, it's like, I doubt it will because the vested interest will not allow that to happen. Um, yeah, I mean... Uh, but the price of carbon of emitting is getting higher and higher as we uh, the capacity of the atmosphere to absorb all our muck uh, reduces. It's, it, there will be incentives soon, I think. But incentives for who? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and who will be able to pay and who will be able to buy out somebody else and it's almost like the end of the Soviet Union you know where <laughs> everybody had chairs and then people just grabbed them off other people and, and uh, then we ended up with sort of an oligarch of we could have an oligarch of carbon polluters uh, um, you know who have the right to pollute you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah um, internalizing the external costs of production Mm -hmm. environmental costs and so on and that really I think does need to happen because our pricing system is highly dis dysfunctional yeah. Um, yeah. blockchain could have some answers there but again I mean, a huge amount of yeah. so, I mean, again I think um, I'm not saying that it doesn't have potential I'm just saying that I, I question whether the kind of smart contracts that will be developed by incumbent industries will, um, will undertake to do that honest work, you know, uh, because it would affect their business models dramatically. And um, so I would be, I, so what I'm saying is that they will, you know, as we've seen for years with the sustainability criteria and declarations, etc., they'll use a sort of framework which appears, you know, it's a classic greenwashing, and you'll sort of have green blockchain washing, you know, through smart contracts. So I, that's my concern, like, I, I, do, I believe that a better world is possible, and blockchain could be part of that better world, but I'm just trying to be a bit more critical that I suspect that when you're already seeing that IBM are like controlling, and Ethereum are like now the big ones, Everledger are controlling what the sort of space in which smart contracts are, are being uh, issued under ICOs, it's, it's already moving in that direction where you get sort of... Uh, the what's the word? Um, have, have my dinner. Um, what's the, uh, I've forgotten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm a I'm a lawyer, I so know. for me, when I hear co contracts, I think about the law mm. around contracts, and there are. Quite often, even though contracts are meant to be a meeting of the minds, for example, there are quite often contractual disputes mm. based on um, a misunderstanding of what the contract meant or failure to deliver, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, I, don't, I won't go in, into that any further, but it would seem to me that with these smart contracts, which seem to be kind of black boxes, if mm. you don't really know what the content of these algorithms are, um, and and there are bound to be disputes yeah. at some point in time. Mm. Mm. How, you know, how are we going to adapt a legal regime to be able to deal with that? Um, have you looked into those, some of those ideas? Are people writing about that and thinking about that? Yeah, there's, there's quite a lot written about that in relationship to financial technology, fintech. Because um, you go back down to the sort of ideal of the um, distributed ledger system and then Ethereum. And... Uh, that in that space, it's permissionless, there's no intermediaries. You need intermediaries. You need intermediaries to resolve conflicts. You need, uh, you need uh, witnesses. You need somebody to act as the third party to sort of ma manage these disputes. Then you need to know how the contract was agreed, that the parties understood the contract and the contents of the contract, which again is problematic uh, regarding uh, smart contracts, because you're not going to fully understand how the smart contract was arrived at and what's contained in it and how it's triggered because each con smart contract is triggering something. So there are, so what, again, what we'll see is that blockchain and smart contracts will be incorporated into the, in, the sort of incumbent industries and 
sectors like uh, Forest Stewardship Council or Sustainable Palm Oil Initiative, and they'll still have their dispute resolution. And they'll have to work out how they're going to deal with smart contract breaches. You know? So I think this is, it's, it will change slightly business as usual, particularly in the sort of legal side, but I, don't, I don't think that the structures are going to change as dramatically as some early advocates of blockchain have been saying. That's my initial. But I, I mean, everybody, well, please ask more questions, but I'm going away and continuing research. So uh, more questions, the better. So if you think I didn't say something, is, please is let me know. Uh, in, ter in terms yeah, like of the, the actual, contract, yeah. well, it's all, it's, all, it's all coded. It's all by yeah, yeah, computer but code. Would it automatically then translate into any local language. I mean, through that code. Yeah, no, no, you could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you could make the yeah. what, what it's doing is allowing something to take place once an action has happened and it's verified, mm -hmm. then the next action is enabled to take place. So you can. It's like a gateway each mm -hmm. time. So you, you enable the next part of a process to take place. Mm -hmm. But the more smart contracts you have, the more energy it takes, the more cost mm -hmm. it is. So you want fewer contracts mm -hmm. within a supply chain, mm -hmm. which goes for simplified supply chains. So you don't want complex supply chains, mm -hmm. you know, which you know, goes to aggregation of markets and all that. You know. mm -hmm. yeah. but it's nothing to do with the language, just the program, coding yeah, program, yeah. any language. So it's not it's not attached yeah. to English, for example. It could work with any language. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, you gave the example of DB Rio, and I just had a question from the website. It, I mean, blockchain doesn't have to be necessarily decentralized, right? In this case, it doesn't seem like the blockchain on which they're storing their wood information or the certification information is decentralized. So the entire chain or the data is stored on the blockchain, but it's controlled by the company. So it seems like, I mean, am I right or wrong? It seems like they're just sort of on the back of the blockchain technology. Anything, anything can use blockchain, but it doesn't necessarily have to be decentralized because nobody has the incentive to use their mining capacity to certify or run their computing power to certify some sort of um, ethical standards for wood production. Yeah. So just going back, the the kind of big ideal where blockchain was, this is the future, the sort of libertarian model, is the completely distributed ledger. You don't have a business who's controlling the information. So with uh, the timber exchange, they do control that process. So you, you've got a, a decentralized exchange of information, and they're using blockchain within that to channel the information and act as gatekeepers for the, the uh, export of the timber. And, and they are acting as the ones saying, yes, we're verifying that it has met all the requirements and are using blockchain to do that. Yeah? So there are different ways in which it can be used. And that's an important point because basically new embedded or new actors can come in and use blockchain technology to... Uh, advance their interests. It may not be to the benefit of local communities, as many people were like, oh, that's great, local communities can establish their own market and be a completely distributed ledger, and I can know that, you know, so-and-so down 300 miles away, what tree it was, at what time, and, what, you know, we will still have business models that have supply chains that are decentralized, it won't, we don't have completely centralized, but decentralized and to varying degrees depending on different commodities and yeah. So <coughs> um, I'm interested in blockchain or smart contracts and guarantees of origin for energy, renewable energy. So one of the things I was considering is the potential of this technology to eliminate intermediaries. Yeah. However, when I started to research a little bit more, I realized that there is not so much a scope to produce intermediaries. Because if you want to produce this certificate, you need an issuing body, you need a 
international registry. Uh, so you eliminate maybe the, the, the company that manages the trade of certificates, who mm. buys and who sells the, the, the certificates. But that is the only stage where you, I see that you can eliminate the topic of uh, certificates. Stages where you can eliminate, eliminate intermediaries in the trade of certificates? Yeah, I think with, um, with the point about intermediaries, is there's a sort of conflict, and it goes back to your point about re resolving disputes and legitimacy and authority. The people want an authority to be there to trust in to resolve disputes. It would be very difficult if we had to resolve all our disputes ourselves. Every, t every single thing that happened, you know, I go and buy a loaf of bread, it's, there's something wrong with it, I have to go and resolve the dispute about the people that made it. Was it from the factory or was it from the person that grew the wheat? Or, you know, and then I have to work all that out. So you want to need an intermediary. And this is kind of where, again, like the, the kind of hype and fiction around blockchain is that we're going to get rid of intermediaries. That's going to reduce costs. It's going to mean that uh, we're just this global democracy of uh, people's exchanging things. So intermediaries are there for a reason. Now, not all of them are the best things in the world. Maybe we could improve intermediaries and hold them more to account. But I think there are problems about the intermediary dimension, partly to do with how much you know as a consumer as to how certification of sustainability is constructed because they are the ones still controlling that. So although the uh, timber exchange example is new, it's novel, it's innovative, it's out there, I think it started last year, was it last year, Tim, Tim, James, or two it's years ago? It's been around a while, actually. It's been around three years? More? Oh, at least. Uh, yeah. Um, but... PFC and FSC are picking up big time on bringing blockchain in-house and using it for their certification schemes. So I think you'll start to see a crowding out of innovative new approaches by these bigger players, right? like you're saying. So it's sort of there's incumbent players, there's new players. Some of them might survive, a couple of them might survive, but the incumbent players will, will try to find ways to employ the new technologies not to keep business as usual, but to adapt, but to not go out of business. And, and I think the point about intermediaries is you have to basically, they have to say you can trust us, right? And that's why blockchain, you can say we're using blockchain, and if you say you can trust blockchain, it's immutable, it's transparent, it's uh, secure somehow that overcomes the problems that have existed before with certification. So it's, it's taking them up a grade. So I mean, it'll be quite interesting to look at how um, certification bodies across different sectors, uh, what kind of narrative they use around blockchain and how they incorporate it into their systems. Right. I, I guess that someone has to audit the producers of this timber. Yeah. So they have to you still need the auditor, you still need yeah. almost everybody except the, the intermediate that used to sell, buy and sell to facilitate the, the, the exchange. Right, so in the supply chain, it just rather, so you still have the auditation, the auditing of the certification, but not within the supply chain, the buying and selling. No, what I mean is that you still need the auditor for certifying that that timber is, meets the sustainability criteria. Yeah, yeah. And I see that the only gap you can eliminate some transactional cost in these transactions of buying and selling the certificates. Okay. I mean, I think the, 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 the point I've been trying to make is that the smart contracts will be the way in which a lot of the, the requirements are met in a, along the supply chain. Um, so that does get rid of some of the intermediaries who will be involved in those processes. Well, when it goes to customs, there will be someone trying to do it. So what I mean is that this blockchain 
seems super revolutionary, but at the end of the day, it's like bookkeeping, no? Kind of thing. So yeah, no, I mean, so, uh, there, there is the argument that it's an, a 21st century version of bookkeeping, which goes back to my slide about uh, Marley from uh, Charles Dickens, you know. Uh, but then, like Maersk, the big shipping, you know, they completely dominate the uh, transportation of freight around the world. Um, they're incorporating blockchain into the, the freight system throughout the whole supply chain. Uh, and the reason they're doing that is to reduce cost. They believe that it will provide the necessary information that they would normally have to undertake some legwork to go and find through uh, the smart contracts that each point along the supply chain has been met and that, that information will be held within the blockchain because it's, it's recorded, it can't be changed, arguably. And so it is, co it is a cost cutting. So you have a revolutionary 21st century ledger system, which how is... About, how about last question? <coughs> <coughs> a little bit technical, because I don't understand very much how this thing works. So it's not can, super technical. If it, if it's, can I just ask if there are other people, and then because if it's quite technical, maybe we'll... It's not very technical. No, well, <laughs> it might be for well, me. It's very technical for me, and I have no idea. Yeah, okay, well... I, I was just wondering what kind of impact do you think it will have on people at the start of the supply chain? If it will have an impact on people in the future? Well... <coughs> Well, again, it comes back to how the, the, the supply chain system is designed and how sustainability criteria are designed and how involved communities could be in those processes, how that's done. So there, are, there is lots of potential, and I mean, so maybe pick up on sort of James's, what you were saying, that there is a lot of potential. It's just I'm wary whether the effort and time will go in because the, those that are sort of pushing this are the bigger players, you know. And uh, the more sophisticated, the more involvement you get, particularly at sort of the point of provenance and origin, uh, the more detailed it is and the more costly it becomes, even through a blockchain uh, smart contract-based system. And, you know, businesses are businesses and they like to reduce costs, you know. Uh, like most, an awful lot of the literature on blockchain, which is primarily, you know, about financial uh, services and the bits about supply chains it's all about reducing cost it's all about efficiency in the administrative side of the supply chain it's not about sharing benefits and enabling people making things better there's a small group of people that are like yeah this this could do this this could do this but am I my reality head goes on, and I just think, yeah, it's <laughs> it's a big battle <laughs> to 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 take something that could be really revolutionary and actually incorporate it into <coughs> an existing embedded <coughs> system of bias and power that is already like drowning these people, like ruin in the forests. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Some people will come up with nice ideas and do things, but on the whole, I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned the energy costs that it takes to run these mining farms in yeah. like China and Russia. And I know these mining farms are largely for like Bitcoin, so they're yeah. not directly concerned with sustainability. But if we are to, like, I mean, if they are to concern themselves with sustainability, is there any effort to change the way these farms are powered to renewable energy sources or anything like that? I remember that was kind of identified as an issue like relatively recently. Yeah. And I wonder if there any, anyone's taken any steps to remedy that. Um, well, China's shut them down. <laughs> shut them down as a, an emergency measure. Um, advocates are saying, you know, originally uh, computers used a lot of energy up. Um, technology will move towards more efficient systems. Another way is uh, that people that are running or making money out of, and this has happened more with cryptocurrencies, have invested that into renewable energy systems to supply the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the mining farms so that they're running off uh, wind or solar. 
So there's, there's one up in Iceland somewhere that uh, was pa totally paid for by um, cryptocurrency profits. Which, uh, so it could be you know, channeling <laughs> bad behaved polluting into <laughs> uh, uh, new renewable energy. I think it, you know, at the end of the day, there is there has already been uh, more efficient mining uh, technologies being developed. It will link a lot to how much the blockchain takes off in other spheres, like uh, you know, say in because other areas are like health, the health services, like to hold all your records in terms of your health, uh, so that wherever you go. A doctor can access that health record. The insurance can ins access that health record. Um, does away with lots of paper. Does away, you know, so this calculation of the energy cost is also maybe taking into account other things that aren't <coughs> used anymore. Like it could be a switch away from lots of paper, but we've seen that. That was in the 70s when we <laughs> weren't going to use paper anymore. <laughs> Any more? Any more? I'll, I'll ask you what, answer your question now. Yeah. Yeah, Dean. Oh, yeah. Um, my interest is in the distributed network, but in terms of housing and property ownership, and how potentially blockchain or ICOs in terms of crowdfunding could help change that whole system. So many people could crowdfund and they could buy a space together rather than big players buying up several properties. like. Like mm. um, do you have any experience in that area? Or yeah. have you thought about anything like that? Like those implications of blockchain? I've, no. I've, I've read about um, the, the use of crowdfunding to raise capital through cryptocurrencies to buy property. Uh, th I mean, th these are problems about sort of whether it's acceptable to the existing um, property system within a country. Uh, and at the moment, there's a lot of resistance happening on that side. Uh, there's also resistance even to sort of crowdfunding and renting. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of move as well to sort of use uh, blockchain to undermine Airbnb so that it's one-to-one, -one, so you don't go through uh, Airbnb as a, as, as a, as a centre point, you know, decentered, it's distributed. Um, so yeah, I'm, but I don't. I'm not a big follower of housing and stuff. But yeah, but there, there, there is quite a lot in around. Yeah. I just uh, you mentioned at the beginning it is mainly IBM which has just become your. I, IBM of in, in the uh, taken a, environment. Yeah. I, or across all the blockchain. IBM um, are hosted. They're in it. They've set up a platform for people to uh, set up their own. Um, smart contracts and their own ICOs, uh, initial coin offerings. So it's a sort of experimental <coughs> space. So they don't have to build the blockchain themselves. So mm -hmm. this is this space that they've enabled. Um, so it's kind of like a lab that they've nice. built and they're funding. Uh, but so very, stri like very strategically. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit like the iCloud. Yeah, kind of yeah, 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 I've, yeah, I've been saying yes to that. <laughs> but other actors, I mean, Facebook are now like going, well, where can we get in? How can we get into this? And so, you know, it's a, it's a space that's going to change. But lot, I think a lot of the big players in terms of, like, um, you know, the internet actors, the big groups there, Google and Facebook, etc., will start to try to see where opportunities for them are. Um, and you've got to remember, they're some of the biggest holders of data. 